next speaker is giving a presentation on hacking in the age of declining everything. Uh, his ah. name is Emerson. Whoop. Oh, there we go. They, they, they said it wasn't a good idea to, to sit on this, and <laughs> now I know why. Your end of the world is really close. Okay. Yes. Here he is. That's right. Hello, everybody. Hello, Berlin. Yeah, you know, give it up for whatever. Okay, I, I, I warn you now that, you know, I, uh, I've had quite a hard Congress so far, and, you know, there's been too much smoking and drinking and smoking and drinking, so I only finished this a little while ago, and uh, it's open to debate sort of what my mental state is right now. I don't know. I blame him, actually, for everything. McFly, I'm looking at you. Okay, um, is it possible? I don't know. Can everyone see this laser pointer? Uh, yes? Yeah. I, I heard a dissenting voice. <laughs> it said no. Okay, cool. So, um, a little bit about me. Uh, you know, who am I to tell you everything you know is wrong? And uh, I, I missed my name off of this, which probably was an oversight. You know, just in case you didn't know, my name is Emerson Tan. I uh, do uh, all sorts of uh, interesting things. By day, I'm a computer security consultant, which makes me a very, very boring person and, and not the sort of person you want to bring to parties. Unless it's this kind of party, in which case everything's cool. Um, in my spare time, I volunteer for a, a little disaster relief agency called Map Action, which takes me to all sorts of godforsaken places around the world from where I draw my examples. Hence, the travels of the author. Uh, the author being me, obviously. Uh, and uh, I do some work for the UN as well, so you, know, you can write those down. And I've never really done anything terribly important, and I'm not famous. All right? Sorry, you know, like... That's Dan Kaminsky's department, you know. You know I, I can't do things like, you know, like stream MP3s over DNS or something, you know, because that would be cool. But uh, no, sadly, I'm not that technically adept. I mean, this is running on Windows, for God's sakes. It's not my computer! Okay. And uh, my background is uh, I started out as a, uh, an astronomer, and uh, I ended up specializing in uh, looking at other planets in the solar system. And uh, I've kind of kept these other interests, and, you know, and that's what's driven me towards uh, uh, this, the presentation that you're going to see. So, um, right, I've got to remember now, because uh, what I put next... What did I put next? Oh, yeah, here we go. The future! Um, this is what... Well, I mean, does there, hands up here who used to watch cartoons on Saturday morning. What, what were the rest of you doing? Sorry? Okay. So anyway, this is, the, this is the Jetsons. This is what people in the 60s and 70s maybe uh, thought the future would be like. I, I'd like to know if anyone has any idea what this thing here is, because, you know, I, plainly this is what happens when you genetically modify corn a bit too much. <laughs> you know, I mean, look at it, you know, big... And you can't walk on springs. Anyway, as you can see, they have a, a flying car, and uh, the dog looks stoned. <laughs> oh, no, he's cross-eyed, you know, but he's a robot, so that's okay. And, and I'm sure this is unsafe, and you know, everyone lives in these houses on stilts. And there's no obesity in the Jetsons, which I don't quite understand, because all they do is sit there and press buttons all day. And, you know, and as we all know, if you sit there all day and just press buttons, uh, you turn into a whale. Uh, and uh, none of these people are whales. And, was anyone here for the porn competition yesterday? Yeah. I mean, like, you know, Jetsons porn. I mean, come on, that's just wrong. So anyway, this is what we thought the future would be like. Uh, hands up anyone here who's got a flying car. <laughs> Liar! <laughs> I've seen your car. And uh, it's, it's old. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is, what's quite interesting is that... Um, uh, our ideas about what the future would be like are almost, A, inevitably wrong, because, you know, the Jetsons supposedly lived in the year 2000, and, you know, they had a flying car and all this kind of stuff. And very often, our ideas about uh, um, the future are based very often on myths. And uh, let's, uh, let's have a quick examination of, of what some of those myths that led up to the Jetsons were. You know, so here we go. Some modern myths debunked. Uh, Right, hands up here, who would vote for a politician who said, year on year, I, uh, my policies uh, aim to make you poorer? Anyone here going to vote for that? No. I'm, 
Okay, Corey, you're weird. <laughs> no, no. And I know you're only doing that just to, to, to get a rise out of me. Uh, something quite interesting is, and I, I, I wish I had a bit more time and I wasn't quite so high earlier on, because otherwise I would have made a nice little graphic, and the graphic would have had, like, planet Earth up here, like a division thing and, and uh, an infinity sign, and anyone knows that... Everyone knows that uh, any finite number divided by infinity is as close to zero as makes no odds. Quoted straight from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, and uh, what's interesting is that um, all our economic, all our assumptions about the future generally are built on this idea that, you know, growth and progress is, you know, infinitely possible. And if we just push hard enough and have the right technology and the rest of it, we can engineer everything. So I don't know why I'm making a sweeping motion, but you know, you get the idea, you know, like nature goes over here, uh, we'll just take over all this space over here that was previously occupied by polar bears and panda bears and, and fish and stuff, you know. Uh, but what we fail, or what we very often fail to take into account is that most of the natural world actually supports our modern systems, our modern way of life. Um, so, Really, when we grow, we have to ask ourselves, are we growing at the expense of the rest of everything else on Earth? And uh, I would argue that actually, for all our notions of progress, that's actually predominantly what we do. We actually trade the fixed resources of the Earth, which is this big spherical thing in space, and because we haven't bothered to go out to the rest of the solar system and loot that, uh, you know, there's nothing coming in, and all we're doing really is just recycling stuff. So, infinite growth is possible. So, you know, our myths that led up to the Jetsons are, you know, things like infinite growth is possible, but the planet's resources are finite. Now, remember what I was saying about infinite, finite number, infinity, zero? And technology can fix everything. Flying cars apart and the weird genetically modified corn thing. Um, but something very interesting, if you look at the research that goes on into the core technologies that keep our society running, like, for instance, energy and agriculture and things like this, you actually find that the actual pace of progress is actually very slow. The big gains have already been made. Um, the green revolution of the, uh, uh, of the, of the 60s and 70s consisted very much of like, you know, taking this oil out of the ground and turning it into pesticides and then proceeding to obliterate all the other life that was uh, uh, attempted to eat our stuff. And uh, very effective it was too. You know, I mean, yeah, you know. How many people here are farmers? Okay, how many people here have ever been to a farm? That's Germany. <laughs> that's, that's, that's very true. That's, that's very true. That's very true. Um, how many people here eat only organic food? Well, this really is German, isn't it? You know, if you give the same lecture in the States, yeah, everyone will go, oh, go what? You know, apart from the one guy with Birkenstock sandals and hasn't washed for six months, he'd be like, yeah, me, I'm, I'm a vegan too. <laughs> I don't like vegans. <clears throat> so, no, so here's something quite interesting. Progress in fundamental has been quite slow. And what's interesting, if you went 30 years ago and said to, you know, to your, your leading fusion scientist, right, how long before we can have fusion power here on Earth and electricity too cheap to meter and uh, uh, you know, flying cars and everything else? And he would have said about 30 years. A good friend of mine works at CERN, and uh, also he uh, is a participant on the ITER project, ITER, the uh, new uh, f big fusion experiment. When I asked him the other day, how long before we have a fully working fusion reactor and, and you know, Star Trek and stuff, and he actually said 30 years. It's a constant. It is a constant. <laughs> it is a constant. Fusion is always 30 years away. And it, he, was, uh, he was very adamant that, uh, uh, that it would take 30 years because... Um, it turns out that uh, in order to build a fully functioning fusion reactor, you need something called tritium, which is uh, an isotope of uh, hydrogen. And it turns out the world's biggest source of tritium is actually U.S. nuclear weapons. And when they asked the U.S. and said, you know, guys, you know, we're building this big experiment. Would you like to give us all your tritium? And unsurprisingly, the U.S. actually turned around and said, no, we need those for our bombs. Sorry, get lost. So it'll take about 30 to 40 years to actually make enough tritium to actually make something like this go. Uh, so, it's coming, honest, another 30 years, that'll make me 62. <sighs> oh dear, never mind. Anyway, 
So, um, I'm going to argue that the Earth is, is, that our little planet here is in a bit of a mess. And uh, in fact, actually, we've rather screwed up the uh, chance for uh, an organized, well-ordered transition into the new sustainable environment. You know, one filled with uh, tweeting birds and organic farmers and everyone wears Birkenstocks and doesn't wash for three months. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, you know, you've seen them, you know, on the TV. They're, they're wittering on about, you know, like organic, sustainable stuff. And, you know, and then you realize that, in fact, actually, if you sat in a room full of them and the rest of it, you know, your highly, uh, your very delicate, highly polished noses would, would be like, ugh, you kind of smell of manure. So, uh, you know, we've kind of pushed it quite kind of far in getting to where we are. You know, so uh, we've managed to create, uh, uh, get to a situation where it appears to be there are a number of convergent crises that look like they're all going to come up and uh, smack us all in the head all at once. Because, you know, it never rains, it only ever pours. And so, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've done something a bit unwise here with the, uh, with the climate, uh, you know, in the course of uh, building all our great things, like my uh, nice Dell computer here, and my, uh, you know, cheap Levi's, and I don't know, what's this, Terra Mineral Wasser, uh, and the rest of it. You know, we've... Uh, in the process of creating our lovely consumer society, we have managed to chuck out loads and loads of pollution because, in fact, most of our energy comes from horribly unclean sources like oil, coal, and gas. Coal being the dirtiest, gas being the cleanest, and oddly enough, they're also coal is the dirtiest, oil is the sorry, coal is the most common, oil is the next most common, and then gas. That's actually what we have least of, but it's the cleanest. Um, so, in the course of polluting our planet, we've managed to make it quite hot, and things are going to change. Uh, it looks like oil production has actually finally stalled out, and uh, will may start declining sometime in the next 10 years or so, which makes everything just way more expensive. And uh, that's a real annoyance, because when everything gets really expensive, you can afford less of it. And then, you know, we're back to toiling in the fields and smelling like manure again. Uh, and environmental stresses. We seem to be really good at polluting everything. And in fact, one of the things that's happened, or one of the really interesting things, anyway, as far as I'm concerned, uh, is that what we've done is we've actually just exported our really horribly polluting industries away from Europe. So uh, Europe's really clean and green, and our environment is nice. And, and we just exported the polluting technologies to China instead. So now the Chinese get to suffocate in blinding smog after they've bought our steel mill from uh, Krupp or... Uh, uh, what's the name of the other big German steel companies? Like Thyssen and Krupp, and there's another one whose name I've totally forgotten. Uh, what's really interesting is that up until very, very recently, only in the last year or so, there's been very, very little meaningful preparation or, or action of any kind. And I don't know, how many of you guys uh, here uh, follow things like... Uh, followed the Bali uh, environmental conference... So that's less than 10%. Oh, and, well, well, it's still less than 10%. Sorry. Um, if you read the final declaration that came out of that, you'll notice that there are talks about having talks, about having more talks, and everybody's going, well, you know, we'll just have to wait for a year until, you know, Bush leaves and we get some other sort of more environmentally friendly U.S. Pres administration who aren't going to be quite so keen on, on you know, growth at the expense of everything. Um, but something makes me think that some of these myths, the myths that we saw on the last slide, are so heavily ingrained that it's very unlikely that any democratic government is actually going to risk its neck by actually implementing policies that cause real economic pain. We are locked into, into this railroad, you know, and it's just sort of speeding on down here towards uh, um, some sort of really unsustainable, nasty place. Uh, and uh, we get to ride the train. Sadly, we don't get to lay the tracks. Yeah, sorry, I mean, it's really grim, you know. I mean, like, if you want to go and watch the other talk, you know, which is about, you know, like, how to rip people off for loads of money, and, you know, <laughs> do it. You know. Because, you know, if you're all going to die, you know, you might as well have a good time while you're going to do it, you know. I mean, laugh it up, wide boy. Good. So, you know, and we've got very little willing. It appears that we've got very little, little willingness here to actually address 
some of the underlying issues, like, for instance, exporting our polluting technologies, like, for instance, coercing the Americans and the Chinese and the Indians into actually cleaning up their act. There's very, very little will to do it. And the future definitely will not look like the Jetsons. Um, I don't have my flying car. Uh, everyone apart from Jeff doesn't have their flying car. And, uh, you know, it's very unlikely that we will see robot dogs and, and, and you know, like Astro and, you know, that genetically modified weird fluffy thing. The reason their houses are on those big poles is because they've completely destroyed... The yes, that's right. You notice that, that, that nobody's feet ever touches their ground in the Jetsons because, you know, like if they touch the ground, all the pollution would just eat them up and, the, you know, people occasionally fall out of the houses and, you know, it's like, ah, burning, burning! Or something like that. Good one, Seth. I, I like that. I'll have to somehow make that up. Probably also with porn as well, so I can win that other competition. <laughs> Burning Jetsons porn. Yes! <clears throat> so, uh, uh, here we go. Some environmental stress uh, facts. Uh, quite grim, really. You know, humans appropriate just over 40% of the total photosynthetic production of Earth. That's actually quite a lot, if you think about it. I mean, like, how much do you think... Uh, how much do you, does anyone here, has anyone here ever heard of that before? Oh, yeah, good, well done, that's one, that's one. We appropriate an awful lot of the Earth's total content, which doesn't actually leave much for everything else, because we've actually nicked the productive 40%, and the rest of it is kind of like, yeah, spread out very thinly, you know, like no one's farming deserts and stuff, unless you live in Southern California, in which case you do all sorts of unreasonable things, like try and make the desert bloom. Uh, uh, there's a mass extinction in progress. Anyone who uh, um, studies environmental science or indeed zoology or anything like that, um, it's quite funny actually. You know, I, I went to a friend of mine who was doing a PhD in, in uh, uh, zoology and uh, it's amazing, you know, because she comes out with these wonder incredibly depressing facts but she's so cheerful. She's like, oh yeah, you know, we just found this lemur and yeah, we've added it to the already extinct list already because, you know, like we discovered it and uh, it had already been stuffed and put in a museum. So we gave it a name and no one's seen it for the last 20 years. So it's a new species which has already gone extinct before we had a chance to actually give it a name. You know, uh, although that story is not quite as good as my friend who's a paleontologist and he named a dinosaur after his girlfriend. The moment she found out that he'd named the dinosaur after her, she dumped him. <laughs> You know. So, you know, note to the wise, never name anything after your girlfriend because, you know, she'll panic, there'll be a self-commitment thing, and, you know, they'll all fall apart horribly. Uh, so we have a mass extinction in progress. We have species that we actually haven't catalogued or looked at yet, and they're going extinct before we've even found out about them, which, if you think about it, it's actually a pretty sad state of affairs. Uh, most fisheries are approaching collapse. Uh, if you... Uh, um, what's quite something frightening I found out the other day is that sushi is now popular, more popular in China than in Japan. So, you know, you've got 1.6 people, eat billion people all eating sushi, you know, and, you know, there are actually fewer tuna than there are people in China, which is, you know, a bit of a disaster because it's not enough to go around. Uh, so, I don't know, and anyone here who likes their fish, you know, like being from London, of course, you know, I like my fish and chips, and, you know, I was quite horrified the other day to discover that uh, fish and chips... The, the fish from my, from my local uh, fish and chip shop actually was coming from the Pacific because uh, they couldn't actually afford to buy local fish because the fisheries had collapsed. And uh, a funny little Chinese guy behind the counter, and he was trying to insist to me that Alaskan pollock take just like cod, everything's cool. And uh, you know, we've managed to pollute pretty much everywhere um, because pollution doesn't stay in one spot, usually. You know, you sort of like throw it in the ocean or, you know, belt it into the air, and eventually it went to everywhere. If you go to the Pacific, um, there is uh, a big area in the middle of the Pacific, which is a gyre, so uh, you know, a big circular current, and all the plastic crap that's been thrown out of Southeast Asia and the west coast of the US has all wound up in this place, and it's like an area that's it's like, you know, like bigger than like Texas, you know, which is just basically just full of plastic bags and... and, and stuff, and it's just, it's, 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 quite, it's quite grim, you know, um, and uh, you get toxic compounds that actually build up in all your top predators, so for instance, you know, there you are, and you want to chow down on your polar bear, I, I really wouldn't advise that, because they're very, very full of toxic chemicals, and you get things like uh, um, hermaphrodite bears, 
which sadly the internet does not have a picture of a hermaphrodite polar bear. Otherwise, I'd show you one. And, um, but I have been assured by, by, by people that such things do exist, and uh, mostly they're down to uh, too many contraceptive pill chemicals winding up um, in the uh, food chain. And, of course, you know, pregnant polar bear chows down on the seals, seals full of uh, PCBs and estrogen analogs, and uh, eventually that builds up in the mother's bloodstream, and, you know, after a while you end up with bi-curious polar bears with too many sets of organs. And it's kind of weird and wrong. Uh, let's not do that. And uh, as top predators, uh, you should be happy to know, uh, hands up who has a young child. Hands up who's got a young breastfeeding child. Anyone? Oh, you do. Yeah. Um, interesting fact. Um, human breast milk actually contains now more toxic chemicals in it than cow milk. So, you know... <laughs> But that's, the, but breast is still best, you know, so don't worry about it, okay? Um, but that's just, an, that's just an example of how, of how the food chain concentrates um, toxic compounds into, uh, you know, into top predators. And actually the health of top predators is actually a very good indication of how healthy the rest of the ecosystem is. So, for instance, if you start seeing things like, you know, malformed polar bears and, you know, tigers that are unable to reproduce and peregrine falcons with, you know, with, who produce eggs without shells and the rest of it, you can, you can pretty much guarantee that the rest of the ecosystem underneath it is starting to look increasingly unhealthy. Uh, and we're starting to see a lot of this. So, if, you know, if you go to some places in China, some places in India, um, certainly uh, marine mammals and the like, you start to see a lot of this, uh, a lot of this kind of uh, damage. Uh, and there's good indication that you know, it's reaching a level now where um, some of these ecosystems are on the verge of failure. And I'll talk about that in just a second here. So, where are we? Oh, no. Do, 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 do. Biofuels. Yeah, there we go. Mass extinction in progress. Yeah, there we go. Right. Okay, resource extraction. So, we are really busy here um, ripping oil and gas and things like this out of the ground. And... Uh, how many people here have ever heard of a term called peak oil? Some of you. Yeah, there we go. Wow. That's lots of you. Okay, very good. How many of that is listening to me making you all very, very depressed? I think that's probably Julian. Yeah, see. Oh, bloody hell. Sorry, man. I, I've wrecked your show, you know. You, you, you can go now. You've, you've heard the rest of the talk probably before. Yeah, don't even hang around here. Go, no, go downstairs. Get high. It's good. So anyway... Here we have uh, a quick graph from uh, the U.S. Energy Information Administration, which shows the oil production from the United States. And you can see that it has a sort of like bell-shaped curve here. And uh, this, this bit here is the discovery uh, in Alaska of Alaskan North Slope oil, which put off the uh, final, final net production peak off a little bit uh, to the year 19... I can't see that, actually. 19, 1988 or something? Um, What's interesting is that if you look at the resource extraction curve for any given resource, um, they all have the same sort of bell-shaped curve. Uh, and what's on this side of the curve here, um, you know, you just drill a hole and oil just sort of gushes out of the ground and, you know, everyone gets coated in black stuff and, you know, and wells blow out and people get killed and, you know, it's, uh, you know, and oil executives get even big and fat and you end up with people like J.D. Rockefeller and and. and Indeed, people like Dick Cheney. Uh, you reach this peak, which is the peak of production. That's uh, the fastest you can ever rip it out of the ground. And then afterwards, you get to the second half of the resource, which is much, uh, which is <laughs> much harder to extract and it becomes more, much more costly. So if you because obviously at this point, you know, there's no more pressure in the reservoir, so you actually have to dig the stuff out or pump it out, uh, which becomes much more expensive and becomes a real pain in the ass. Um, the global peak of production is probably... Some people estimate that it's gone, 2005. And other people... Uh, uh, other well-respected well research groups... Oops, it's wrong way. There we go seem to think that it may be pushed off a little bit, you know, due to new discoveries and the like. The most oil and gas that ever was discovered in one year was in 1969. And globally, 
the oil and gas companies went on this huge, massive surveying boom. So they, they went out and surveyed the whole planet. And they found the most oil and gas in 1969. All the basins where you might find oil and gas have been identified. Now, increasingly, uh, oil and gas companies are now starting to look in places which were either technically unfeasible or economically unfeasible. So, you know, they're doing things like uh, digging up the Canadian tar sands, and the Canadian tar sands are uh, they're basically the stuff you build roads out of, right? And what they do is they dig it up, uh, take all the water out of the Athabasca River, uh, then uh, burn some burn a third of Canada's natural gas output to actually boil the tar out of the sand uh, and then upgrade the tar to oil that will actually flow and then ship it off. And if uh, anyone here has been paying attention to the, uh, the price of oil, you'll notice that it's gone up from... It started out the year at something like, uh, uh, you know, just about $40 a barrel, and at one point it became almost $100 a barrel. Some of this is due to the decline of the US dollar. Thanks, George Bush. Uh, and some of it is actually due to, it's, a lot of it is due to skyrocketing demand, this big red line here, which is actually mostly China and India in the developing world. And uh, some of it is actually because the actual net amount of production has actually started to fall a little bit. And OPEC says every year we will boost production and we will boost production, but they never actually release the data to back up those assumptions. So the rest of the world is left guessing. And in fact, rather strangely, uh, round about in the, in the sort of early 80s, uh, when... Uh, Easy. When OPEC decided to tie the production quota to the amount of stated reserves, everybody's reserves suddenly sort of like tripled overnight. Because obviously, you know, you want to pump the oil and the gas as fast as you can because you need to pay for to have your arms cast in solid gold with big swords and stuff. And, you know, you need to make giant, I don't know, statues of yourself that always face the sun doing this. You know, the sun never sets. Uh, don't laugh. People actually do this stuff. Uh, if you ever go to, uh, I think it's Uzbekistan, um, the first... Turkmenistan. Oh, sorry, Turkmenistan. I was like, Turkmenbashi. Thanks, Julian. Uh, if, you ever go, if you go to uh, the capital of Turkmenistan, there is a huge statue of President Nazayov. And the first thing they did when they discovered oil and gas in Turkmenistan was that he went and spent all the money that uh, the companies gave him uh, uh, for the oil and gas to build a giant gold plated statue of himself and it's got a clock on the bottom and it rotates so it always faces the sun so the Turkmen's always know who you know who the boss is and also know who to thank for the wealth that they're experiencing because he's turning around like this gesturing to the sun never sets on him <clears throat> so uh, right sorry I was a you're not laughing I'm not doing my job right uh, so demand seems to grow relentlessly because everyone wants to live like... A, actually, more specifically, they want to live like him. Yeah, that's you, Seth. Uh, and the Ameri rest of my American chums. Um, yeah. Uh, most of the developing... If you go to the developing world, um, rather interestingly, uh, they all seem to... They all, have these they all have this idea that they want to emulate the American way of life. And if you go to Shanghai, Shanghai, central Shanghai, actually banned bicycles in favor of cars. Because apparently bicycles are unsightly. Yeah, I know. Mad, isn't it? Uh, and it seems that many developing countries just seem absolutely hell-bent on creating societies that look like the US, and to a lesser extent, maybe Europe. And, you know, there's this great drive, and everybody's on board, because, you know, you get exposed to the media, you know, and everybody wants a Ferrari and a, an apartment, two cars, and, you know, washing machines and all the rest of this crap that goes with it, right? Um, but, all of these, uh, but all of that consumption can only really be driven by you know, increasing resource extraction and also increasing, more importantly, re increasing energy extraction. We live, the most in, we live in the most intense or energy intense time of human civilization. We use roughly, every year, we use 400 years worth of fossil fuels, i.e. it took 400 years to accumulate the fossil fuels that we burn in one year. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, there we go. So if you want to understand that. Good. So there we go. Peaking refers to the maximum rate that a resource can be extracted. After this, it's downhill all the way. So everything becomes much more expensive and much dirtier because obviously you burn the clean, easy-to-use stuff first and then gradually you wind down and eventually you come to coal 
And then, you know, you want to turn coal into gas by injecting high-pressure temperature steam into coal seams. You know, all gas comes bubbling out. Uh, peaking about, peaking, uh, worrying about peaking oil and gas is no longer the province of cranks and nutcases, like yours truly. Uh, you actually, if you look at the increasingly um, even big oil, Western oil companies like Chevron, uh, BP, and Shell, actually are increasingly saying that, hang on, we think that we can probably extract no more every year than maybe between 84 and 100 million barrels a day. And that's it. After that point, supply does not grow. And they also, you know, a lot of geologists will tell you that you will get to that point, but you will not stay there for very long because that is the highest you'll ever get. From that point, everything becomes more expensive, more difficult. Uh, we really didn't worry about this until now, which is kind of a bit late because it's already happened, uh, possibly. And uh, with no mitigation plan, uh, the economic crisis is likely to become uh, severe and kind of normal. Uh, hands up, who remembers the Weimar Republic? <laughs> oh, come on, were you guys all asleep in history class or something? Hey, what's wrong with you people? <laughs> Jesus, you know. Uh, well, you, 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 you remember the... You remember the you remember the classic photo, right, of, of the guy coming out from being, after being paid, and he's got a wheelbarrow full of rice mark, yeah, you know, to buy a loaf of bread. Uh, don't be too... Sorry? <laughs> but you went to school? Ah, <laughs> uh, okay, okay, good point, good point. Who was taught about the Weimar Republic at school? <laughs> yeah, there we go. God. I forget, I'm talking, I, I forget, I forget, I'm talking to a nerdy audience. You want everything in nice one, you know, binary, you know, ones and zeros, you know, like there's no ambiguity here. Uh, so, uh, right, okay, where was I? You've made me lose my train of thought. I just need to think about this a minute. Ah, there we go. Yeah, I remember now. So, uh, you know, so, but that kind of hyperinflation, um, although that was for entirely different reasons, um, there's, no, there's nothing certain that says that that will not happen again in uh, the advanced world. Um, and possibly even worse condition called stagflation, where your economic output kind of stagnates because you're running out, because you don't have adequate inputs. But at the same time, inflation goes through the roof. So, it's, you know, you, what eventually happens is your, your buying power becomes progressive less and you get goods shortages. And uh, in a second here, we will actually see an example of what happened the last time around in Cuba. Well, that, exactly that happened. So, uh, where are we? Climate change, yeah, you know, debate's over. Humans are making the climate too warm. How many people here do not believe that humans are responsible for mucking around with the climate? Anyone? Okay, one or two dissenting voices. Jeff, you're an asshole, so I'm not going to count you. <laughs> so that's one. It's, you know, it's, it's a German and European audience, so th this, that doesn't surprise me anymore. If I was doing, giving this talk in the US at, say, DEF CON, A, I'd be booed off the stage. Uh, you know, fucking hippie, get off! You know, we want to play the TCPIP drinking game! Uh. Uh, and, you know, I'd be pelted with stuff until sort of hounded out into the cold desert, uh, sorry, hot desert air to shrivel up and die. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, like, as far as we're concerned, debate is over. Humans are causing the climate to warm up. Our models produce results that broadly approximate, approximate reality. But, but the models seem to underestimate the sensitivity of some of these systems. So, for instance, Arctic ice loss last year uh, and three years before that, appeared to be running something like three to five times ahead of our worst-case scenario in most of our models. So the Hadley Center in, in, uh, in the UK, which is uh, part of the UK Met Office, their best model says that we should, have, we should have had more ice in the last two years in the summer than we actually had, which suggests that, in fact, actually the system is much more sensitive. People reckon, uh, my friends at the British Antarctic Survey reckon, that you should be able to sail over the pole by about 2012. So there'll be no ice at all in the summer. Um, and, uh, you know, our, it seems to indicate that our worst-case scenarios seem increasingly likely. 
due to that lack of political will and, you know, not electing people who say year on year you're going to use less energy and you're going to be a little bit poorer and you're going to have to eat organic food and wear Birkenstocks and be a bit more of a hippie. <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. You get the idea. Uh, here we go. It's going to get hot. So, um, where it says low growth, moderate growth, uh, high growth, these refer to the IPCC scenarios from the IPCC synthesis report. Uh, growth refers to uh, the growth in CO2 emissions, uh, which obviously, given that CO2 emissions seem to rise in lockstep with economic growth, you know, the faster your economy grows, you know, the more crap you throw into the air whilst you try and make all your nice computers and bottles and clothes and stuff. You know, disposable little plastic trinkets, you know, uh, care bears, stuff like that. Uh, and uh, if you look, on this, if you look on, on this side, you have to remember that this report is very conservative. So the system may be sensitive enough that this bottom scenario here, where everything gets really, really, really freaking hot, um, may actually be a lot closer than we think, simply because if you push the climate beyond some tipping points, the other systems that keep the climate cool and stable disappear. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll relate a quick story about dinosaurs, because um, I like dinosaurs. And hands up here who doesn't like dinosaurs. Uh, doesn't like dinosaurs. All right, you, you're weird and you're wrong, because dinosaurs are cool. Uh, d most of the oil and gas uh, was formed in two periods, in the late Jurassic and the mid Cretaceous. How many people know what I just said made any sense? Jurassic, Cretaceous. All right, who's seen Jurassic Park? Yeah, there you go. Right, remember Jurassic Park. Okay, keep in mind Jurassic Park for a minute. No, 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 keep in mind Jurassic Park. Okay, so these two periods when most of your oil and gas comes from, Jurassic Park, are some of the hottest periods in Earth's history. They are, in fact, actually super greenhouse worlds. One of the reasons uh, that the dinosaurs uh, even became even, even possible was simply because the world was very warm, very wet, and uh, was covered pretty much top to bottom. Like the, 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 the configuration of the continents was different, right? So, but you had big land masses where, in areas where it's got an awful lot of rainfall, and you know, everything was kind of wet and very lush. And so you saw these enormous giants grow. Uh, quite interestingly, you, the big sauropod dinosaurs, you know, your, your Dip Diplodocus and Brachiosaurus and the rest of it, had enormous bodies. And part of the reason they needed enormous bodies is because they have huge guts. Because the plant food that they were eating was of such low quality, but grew very, very fast, that they needed those huge bodies and huge guts to actually digest the food. Sorry? Okay, sorry, I, I either hallucinate, I think probably hallucinated someone talking back to me there. It, it happens, especially at Congress. Um, so, you know, you have, these, you have these giant herbivores, and then in order to eat the giant herbivores, you have giant carnivores, and everything just gets progressively bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, we're mammals, so we're warm-blooded. The dinosaurs were sort of like semi-cold-blooded, especially the sauropods, which were almost certainly cold-blooded. We are poorly adapted to a really, really hot planet, and most of the life on Earth is really poorly adapted to a really hot planet. Back in the age of the dinosaurs, when our oil and gas formed, ocean circulation shut down, and that's how all of the plankton and other crap that fell into the oceans actually didn't rot and actually was stored there, the carbon was stored there, effectively then becoming our oil and gas after you know, several hundred million years. It was warm enough that you could go skinny dipping at the North Pole in the age of the dinosaurs. And if you couldn't go swimming in the, where the, Bahamas, the current latitude of the Palmas, because it was too hot, you'd have actually scolded yourself if you'd gone for a swim, because it was like 38 to 45 degrees at, you know, at the equator. That was the temperature of the sea. So it's kind of warm. Uh, who finds that in the least bit shocking? <laughs> yeah, some. Some. Okay. So, interestingly enough, those periods also had the highest carbon dioxide concentrations of any periods in Earth history. So, it seems to be that you need a super greenhouse, 
with lots, sorry, lots of carbon dioxide to start the super greenhouse, and then the ocean circulation shuts down, and that stores then the carbon, thus ice reforms at the pole, ocean circulation starts again, everything cools down. And the Earth actually, through time, has been on this kind of seesaw like this. So, okay. Hello, Brave New World. Here is a, a, a model of precipitation. Uh, this is from a medium case model. So you can see that Western Europe here, it gets drier, uh, you know, so uh, less, uh, less rain for all of us. And uh, I don't know, who likes wine? Who's a wine drinker? Yeah, good. Um, it probably means that actually your wine will probably actually, from, from here in Germany, will probably actually get a little bit better and the terroir will be a bit better because obviously as it dries out, the vines put their roots down further and uh, they pick up more mineral nutrients from the rocks. And there are, so, so the, vine t you know, the grapes take on a, a, a much more specific character. So you get lots of good, good, good harvests, very good vintages, and then everything will kind of dry up and then the vines will die and you, you're kind of fucked. Sorry, I just thought I had to throw that in there. Um, as you can see, the Sahara gets even drier still, and uh, those marginal bits of the Sahara, those marginal bits here above the, above, hello, where is it? There we go. Uh, above the uh, current Sahara get even drier still, so the Sahara starts to move north. Um, there's actually a very good model which seems to indicate that the Sahara might actually even jump the Mediterranean. And all those big forest fires that you see in Spain and Portugal um, are the first step in desertification. So the, the forests burn off. There's not enough rain to support new forests, and then it becomes scrubland, and then from scrubland, eventually there's not enough water, not enough rain, and eventually you come to desert. And uh, there are a, a number of models actually converge on, on this outcome, where in fact the southern bit of Europe starts to become much more like North Africa. Speed it up, okay. So anyway, so there we go. We, yeah, it, it's bad, you know. So, you know, here we go, some consequences, mass extinctions, keystone species go, reduced human capacity, carrying capacity, you know, this is interesting, climate disasters are rising, so I get a lot more calls on my time, which as a contractor means I earn much less money, because I keep on having to run off to disasters around the world, which really pisses me off. Actually, I enjoy it really, otherwise I wouldn't do it. Uh, more flooding, fires and drought, and lots more little disasters, lots more little crises. What am I doing for time? Right. And here's something interesting. We are living in the most integrated period in human history. Uh, for instance, virtually none of the bits in my Dell were made here in Europe. Virtually all of them were made in the Far East. We are totally dependent on global trade. Any kind of disruption to global trade, and we are royally screwed. To give you an example, here's an example from a few years ago. I was working for uh, a big consultancy company. I used to work for Arthur Anderson. And one of our clients was uh, Cisco. And uh, this guy from Cisco related to me a, a, a story where he had uh, uh, container loads of uh, components coming from the Far East, coming to, his plant in, uh, to, coming to an assembly plant, in, I think it was in Mexico or something. And one day, one of these ships sank. And it turned out that they had to shut down production, switch production uh, for two weeks because it turns out that Cisco only ever kept three days' worth of parts, of some parts, in inventory. So, of course, when the ship sank... Of course, you know, like the supply of key parts just dried up, and uh, because they because they could they, they had to book parts that were the, the, they only had to book parts which they held in inventory and weren't in transit on their books. It was a squeeze to try and get more efficiency out of the system. So what happened was it became very 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 efficient, but also very brittle. You, you understand what I mean by brittle? Yeah. No. Fragile breaks easily. System can't withstand any disruption. Uh, previous periods of uh, high integration, people like the Romans, uh, and people from uh, the Romans were very dependent on corn and grain from North Africa. And uh, when that trade collapsed, everyone got really poor, and we had the Dark Ages. Uh, the classical Maya were very dependent on uh, their other neighbours, and uh, when their civilization fell apart, um, that was uh, pretty catastrophic. And they actually lost the ability to do things like write and build big structures and things, and, you know, went up in little villages just farming. Uh, we've gone so much further up here, um, if there's any kind of fall, we've got a long way to go. Uh, new Dark Ages? Maybe. Probably not, but, you know, the world 
that we're looking towards may be significantly poorer and much meaner than we anticipated. So it's not, definitely not like the Jetsons. Definitely not like the Jetsons. Uh, so here's a quick worked example. Cuba. Cuba in the early 90s. Soviet Union collapses. Cuba's almost totally support, dependent on Soviet imports because of the U.S. embargo. U.S. embargo, basically you can't do any trade with Cuba or you can't trade with the U.S. No one's crazy enough to piss off the U.S. unless you're Hugo Chavez, and, uh, they, uh, who actually enjoys it. And uh, so as a result, Cuban society pretty much had its lifeline from the outside world cut off almost instantaneously. Oil imports fell by about 90%. Fertilizers, other agriculture, fell by about 80%. They lost 50% of their wheat imports overnight. And, uh, you know, and basically all their, all their development kind of screeched to a halt. And uh, it kind of approximates, a lot of people think that this approximates the kind of trade slowdown and retrenchment as you, you get when oil prices go through the roof and all of a sudden you can't afford to ship stuff at places. Uh, here we go. So they, they implemented wartime rationing. Everyone got a lot fitter and healthier. So obesity in Cuba is now kind of unheard of. There are also very few, there are geeks though still in Cuba, you'd be happy to know. They're just a lot fitter. Um, petroleum became pretty much unavailable. So uh, uh, people would queue up along the side of the road waiting for a government truck to come by. And uh, they actually instituted a law where you actually had to stop and give people lifts. Uh, which is uh, a great place to hitchhike. Uh, heavy industry and technology imports pretty much stopped. And uh, healthcare went from treating people who were ill to preventing people becoming ill because they could no longer afford the real sort of like really advanced acute care which Cuba had been famed for providing beforehand. Uh, they had a crash conversion to organic agriculture. Everyone now has a, uh, a vegetable garden uh, and uh, you basically go to work, do your thing, come home and you know, dig your potatoes or whatever. Um, they moved to biological pest control. Cuba still is stalked by the threat of famine. So if, for instance, there was a hurricane or any other kind of uh, real serious disruption, it is likely you would see a short-term famine in Cuba without external aid. And all this is only possible because, uh, well, crushing state control, really. I mean, you know, Fidel, you know, it, it, is, it is one of, Transparency International rates it is one of the most unfree places on earth. Um, but all of this was only possible because of crushing state control. Um, all of these things were mandated by the central government. In a less ordered society, other things might happen, which I'll show you next. Uh, uh, Cuban hacking. So yeah, the Cubans actually uh, became very adept at keeping everything from before the embargo going. So you see some very odd things. Ancient cars, 1950s Chevrolets and Cadillacs, with Lada engines or tractor engines bolted to them. Um, Weird fusions, like for instance, there was this great thing that I saw, which uh, um, the guy wouldn't let me take a photo of it, but uh, it's uh, an old 1950s American Frigidaire refrigerator repaired with parts from a Cadillac. So it is, in fact, actually a Cadillac refrigerator. It's like kind of, you know, half an engine kind of bolted to the side and it looks very, very weird. The guy was very, very proud of it, you know, like, and he had no formal education at all. Uh, no parts and resource, make for weird and wrong engineering. Everything is recycled, so they, they, you know, like you throw away your old refrigerator, and like vultures, people descend upon it and rip it apart, and you know, all the bits get recycled and something else weird and wrong. Uh, you know, and such a small limitations I overcome. Uh, East Africa, I spent some time in northern Kenya and Somalia, uh, you know, having 12-year-olds wave rocket-propelled grenades under my nose, which wasn't a lot of fun. Uh, most of, East Af okay, most of East, Af East Africa is effectively priced out of the oil and technology markets. So uh, development kind of stalled and started going backwards. Uh, they're all dependent on food aid. Chronic drought made everything worse. And uh, they are weak governments and dictators. And so you saw this descent into lawlessness. So, you know, you get warlords, gangs, militias, and other crazy stuff. Um, but you also still see some very enterprising uh, hackers. This one guy uh, uh, had taken... Uh, uh, two old uh, alternators out of an old Russian tank and had built a power station for his village out of the remains of a smashed Toyota truck, uh, these two alternators and a homemade, home-wound rectifier, which I thought was quite impressive. Uh, and that was in Somalia. That's how they kept power going there. Uh, you know, 
Thank God, though, however, there was no, uh, you know, in East Africa, there's, there's no Tina Turner. Um, and uh, this actually should be a Toyota truck with a 50 caliber machine gun mounted on the back of it, because that's what they substitute for a tank there. Uh, hackers. Hackers, yeah, you've seen this before from Breeze Talk. Hackers probably make bad farmers, so you're going to need to find something else useful to do. Uh, but not to worry. Um, there's plenty to do. Uh, if everything goes to hell in a handbasket economically, um, you will have loads of opportunities to actually become the keystone members of whatever society comes next, because you have the knowledge to turn all the broken old stuff into something new and useful. Yeah, normal engineers do not get trained to do that. You have the right attitude and know how to do it, because you do it every day. So, we're going to have to learn to do more with less, which is great, really, because as everybody knows, um, you, know, you can still get a really old shit computer to do something very cool with just some interesting software. Is that not true? Yeah, see? You know, Linux. Linux still works on my old 386 at home. It's great. Sort of. Um, and uh, as we all know from our previous definition of hackers, hackers love overcoming limitations. Well, I can't think of any other. I mean, like, you know, this is the ultimate sort of limitation circumvention exercise. You know? World is fucked. You know, like, make it go. <laughs> so... Some key skills after the end of everything. Uh, you know, here we go. So you're going to have to learn to teach. You're going to have to learn how to teach people how to hack their environment into somewhere where they can actually live with just the rubbish that was left from beforehand. Uh, basic technical knowledge, you're probably going to need some of that, so I suggest hoarding books on electrical engineering and sort of basic mechanics. Uh, appropriate technology. Who went to Breeze Talk? Yeah. How many people downloaded Breeze Talk? Oh, okay, all right. How many of you want to download Breeze Talk? Yeah, there we go, much better. See? Wow, you don't, you, you don't pay much attention, do you? Okay, look it up. Uh, lame. Pay a fee to the CCC, join. Uh, and, uh, you know, like magazines like Make are really quite interesting because they actually teach people those key skills, you know, those key construct it, build it, make it yourself skills. Which, you know, like, ignoring the idea of hackers being this very narrow, yeah, there you go, narrow I, thing about breaking into stuff. If you think about circumventing limitations and just doing interesting things with technology, make is brilliant. Oh, are we under attack by Klingons or something? <laughs> okay, so anyway, yeah, my time is up, so just apply the hacker's attitude to everything and you'll be fine, and just remember that attitude is everything. If you stay positive... If you stay positive and learn some of the, and, and make sure that you have those key skills and key understandings and keep an eye on the situation, you will prosper. You will become the master in that master blaster relationship, but without the fat guy and no chainsaw and no Tina Turner. Okay, and that's it. Eh? Uh, I don't know. Do we have any time for any questions? Yeah, yeah. yeah we do. Okay. Uh, the rest of you, uh, uh, just leave quietly. Uh, my, my, my question is very simple. Um, yeah. If you, if you were be the, the, the president of the United States and, and you would be to control the price of tax on oil, uh -huh. what would be the ideal price per liter that you would uh, somehow put in, in, in practice? Per liter. It Oil. I know that you have gallons, but in Europe we have yeah, liters, yeah. which is... No, no, uh, I, I live in London. I do liters. Okay. It's cool. Um, <laughs> you would probably have to make gasoline as expensive as coffee, like Starbucks coffee, uh, before, you, before, you actually start, before you actually start to see a real impact on people's driving, driving habits. So, you know, you're looking at U UK prices, you know, so over... Over, two, uh, over, over maybe two or three dollars a litre um, for gasoline before you started to see a really significant impact on their driving habits. Um, yeah, and you're starting, to see it, you're starting to see it happen now. Okay, anyone else? Any, uh, any other questions? 
Yeah, this chap here. Do you really think that there's no hope that technology could save us, for example, with the Earth X Prize um, helping along innovation? The, the problem is that it, it's, it's one of time. Um, if we had the Earth X Prize 30 years ago, um, yes, you could do it because it takes time to build the systems. And the problem that we've got is that a lot of the changes have a lot of inertia built, have a lot of momentum built into them. So we've already pushed, because we've already given it an initial shove, the system now has so much uh, momentum behind it that even if we started on a crash mitigation program now, the odds are pretty good that even by the time we built it and put it in place, we would then need to see, uh, wait for another century or more before we actually started to see some of those effects. So what we're really looking at now is a scenario where we have to adapt to the changes that are already in train. You know, Earth X Prize and the rest of it all notwithstanding simply because the system has already got so much inertia that we've already started moving it, and, it's already started, and there's nothing you can do to actually push it back. Does that answer your, your question to some extent? Uh, it might be possible to travel carbon dioxide. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah and, that's, and, that, and that's very, very true. But again, um, you, know, you have to remember that you know, you're looking at multiple decades to build the systems, and those changes may already have happened within those decades as you were building it. You'd have had to build it in advance. And that's what I'm getting at. So, yes, this gentleman here. What's, what's the effect of the... I, I know that I had a, a, t a teacher at university who is a member of the IPCC. Yep. And he told me that uh, basically the whole issue is about um, those 20 years when you released CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh -huh. The effect of, of uh, uh, thermal effect on the atmosphere is only happening 20 years later. Yeah, that's right. So uh, um, basically the heating, uh, uh, the climate change that we are having somehow now uh -huh. is, is uh, the effect of the, the gas that was uh, emitted 20 years ago. Yeah, well, one of the really interesting things is that the hotter it gets, um, the less able the biosphere is to soak up the CO2 that we subsequently produce, because obviously as, this, as the concentration of CO2 goes up, it gets warmer, photosynthesis becomes less efficient at higher temperatures, and plants actually soak up less CO2 um, in a high CO2 environment. They always kind of maintain the same rate of growth. One of the reasons that the dinosaurs may have had to have such huge bodies is because the quality of the plant material they were eating, it grew really, really quickly, but it was very low quality. Um, simply because it was existing in this high temperature, you know, high CO2 regime. You, know, you see a lot of ferns and things which have virtually no nutritional value at all. Um, and what we're doing, all we're doing is quite literally pushing the world back to the same conditions that actually formed the oil and the gas in the first place. So, you know, we're just speeding up the whole cycle. You know, every time you drive around in your car, all you're doing actually is you're driving a very, very little volcano. You know, it's spewing out carbon dioxide and other stuff, which actually originally came out of the earth in the first place. Uh, does that answer your question? Is that, is, that, is that a good explanation? Okay, anyone else? Anyone want to throw random abuse? Oh, there we go. Yeah, hi. Um, I, there is a theory that the theory of peak oil has actually been invented by the oil companies themselves in order to keep the price high. Could you speak to that? Like, like some of the things I've heard mentioned is that there's the reserve in Iraq, say, that has been untapped now for 20 years. There's Iran, which has really not reached their peak yet, then the, the oil fields in Russia, and then, okay. say, the polar that, north. Okay, uh, we'll address those one at a time. Okay, Iraq. Yes, it is true that Iraq's reserves are not, have not been tapped for the last 20 years. Um, however, that being said, if you bring that stuff on stream, all you do is actually you just push the peak back because you see these resource extraction peaks in pretty much everything. And, you know, I used to be, you know, I did a lot of geology earlier on, um, and uh, I definitely think it's true. And if you talk to anyone in the uh, petroleum geology department at my own university, they would pretty much all, uh, all, all agree with me that, in fact, actually, you know, it's on a finite curve. We're simply just, the Earth simply just doesn't make oil and gas at the re same rate that we burn it. Uh, the... Russia, oh, sorry, Iran actually peaked out in 1978. Um, and what the Iranians have actually started doing is the Iranians, 
went on this crash program of actually re-injecting water and gas back into their reservoirs to keep them pressurized. Uh, and uh, they're now actually having real problems because they've reached kind of the limit of where they can go. One of the reasons why um, there are s some Middle Eastern observers think that the Iranians are actually building nuclear plants, not necessarily to go for the bomb, but because, quite simply, they, cannot no, they can no longer afford to actually burn oil and gas to produce electricity. So what they want to do is they want to export the oil and gas for pots of money. Because the stuff's running out, they need the money now. And, you know, they've got no other resources. They've got no coal or anything. And the only thing they can think of, actually, to maintain that same base load is actually to build nuclear power plants. Um, Russia, the reason that Russia's production is still going up is because after the Soviet Union collapsed, everybody stopped maintaining everything. And basically, their oil production just shut down. But all you're seeing is actually now they're rebuilding the fields and it'll come back again. And it, what you see is actually a, a, a twin peak curve. So it goes up, comes down, goes up again, will peak again at some point, probably in the next five or six years, and then start going down again. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, you can talk to some of the oil executives and the like, but, you know, the, the brutal fact of the matter is it takes 400, you know, we're burning 400 years' worth of ancient sunlight every year. And, you know... You, it's, you know, there's no oil being generated anymore, really, at any kind of appreciable kind of pace. So, you know, it is going to peak at some point. You know, if there's more oil and gas found, that just pushes the peak off into the a bit further into the future. And that's it. Okay, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, okay, very good. Next? Yeah. Um, the humans uh, managed to stop the evolution a while ago, I think. Sorry? Uh, the humans stopped their own evolution. Um, of the human body, we don't go that much more or something. Uh, what kind of impact does have, um, if you look back in history, um, to the example where it was that hot? Um, okay, let me have a quick think about that, because th that's... Yeah, humans... The, the, humans haven't been around for very long. Uh, the great thing about humans is that we've kind of replaced evolution with technology, so we kind of like we, we don't alter we don't alter we, we don't change to fit the environment. We change the environment to fit us. That's why we have things like air conditioning, you know, and fields and farmhouses and cities and things like this. Sorry. Well, you know, it's quite interesting. You know, actually, there are uh, there are an increasing number of fairly extreme green types who actually seem to think that de technologize de de-technologizing everything actually is the only way forward. And what they don't really, they, they have this odd Rousseau-like view of the noble savage, where, you know, it was perfectly okay to, to, to run around making the megafauna extinct wearing nothing but a fur loincloth, you know, and chasing Raquel Welsh around a la one million years BC. Um, and that was fine, because, you know, everything was hunky-dory back then. But in fact, what anthropologists have found is that hunter-gatherer societies are even more conflict-oriented than our societies. Um, they had death rates that approximated World War II, uh, World War II battlefields. So, you know, you have these, you know, guys in loincloths and whatever, and they're busy killing each other when they're not busy killing the local megafauna. And you can actually see humans spreading across the land, and actually, you know, the first thing that happens is that uh, uh, the megafauna goes extinct as we go hunt it, and then population pressure then drives us towards a state of uh, almost perpetual warfare, and actually, agriculture and civilization actually at that, and technology at that point actually look like the things that actually prevent us from, from wiping each other out. Because what they do is effectively we then take natural resources and convert it into more carrying capacity so you can support more people without having to go kill each other. Uh, I, that probably wasn't answering your question, was it? You know, I mean, um, I don't know. Come find me afterwards, you know, like I'll buy you a drink and it'll be cool. Uh, well, one last question. Okay, we have one last question from... Uh, Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh yeah. this is bad. Mr. Difficult. I know him. So uh, the one route I potentially see out of uh, the, uh, the nightmare scenario at the moment, um, so we saw Drew Endy's talk a couple of days ago on um, synthetic biology mm -hmm. and uh, some of the advances that are coming out of that and the incredible sort of above Moore's law speed with which the capabilities in that area are now increasing. Um, do you have any thoughts on potential ways that uh, you know, genetic engineering could give us ways to improve photosynthesis, bring carbon levels down, 
improve food supply uh, and, and use that as a workaround for, for some of these limitations? Yeah, um, th that's actually a very good. That's actually a very good point. Um, Craig Ventner. I mean, like, maybe a little bit of background is required here. Craig Ventner, the guy who was responsible for sequencing the, the uh, human genome, uh, has, has a research institute, and what they're doing is they're working on synthetic biology. So the idea is, is that you know, I build a cell from scratch out of bits of other cells that I've, you know, out of bits of other genomes that I've discovered all over the place, and some that I've created by myself. Uh, yes, we can do that. We can do a lot of things to actually get ourselves out of the mess. The problem is that you have to do all of them all at once, because quite simply, because the system has a lot of inertia behind it, because you've already pushed it, um, we actually need to basically step on the gas. Sorry, step on the gasoline accelerator. There we go. That's something that everyone understands. And researching these technologies, because the lead times for the technology are potentially quite long. And there are also risks associated with releasing completely synthetic organisms into the environment as a whole. Um, one of the problems is, quite simply, overcoming people's natural squeamishness about massive re-engineering of everything. Because that's essentially what you're talking about. You know, you're talking about actually releasing completely synthetic organisms into the wider world because you can't have the effects of scale that you need to actually counteract these sorts of... Not the cat. Uh, to uh, counteract the kind of damage, hang on, counteract the kind of, uh, da, 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 there we go, counteract this stuff, uh, you, in order to counteract this, you're talking about massive engineering, and that sort of synthetic biology means that you actually have to implement it on a global level. So A, you've got to simulate it, B, you've got to be absolutely sure that it works, and C, you've got to be absolutely sure that it's not going to displace something else in the ecosystem. Um, one of our real problems is that we're, we're really bad at modeling all of this stuff. So, you know, you could potentially release it and then have all sorts of weird unintended consequences. One of the things you need to be absolutely sure of is that your solution does not create a worse problem than the original one. Uh, you know, and, but I think you should do everything, anything you can do, like more efficient, everything from more efficient lights, don't fly so much, um, you know, support your local community, uh, you know, don't buy so much cheap rubbish, you know, make, tell your friends and family not to give you cheap plastic trinkets for Christmas. Anything you can do like that is worth doing. Uh, yes, man with the Mohican. It's, um, all these techno fixes like high yield gene engineered agriculture and all yes. this are very, very, very energy intensive. Yes, they are. Horribly and so. And with peak oil and peak gas and everything coming along, do you think that might actually be a solution even if we get on this crash program to engineer everything because if you have no energy you're not going to be running your high yield farm yeah that's very good that's that's a very very good point um, the net energy return on investment so in other words the amount of energy you put in to generate something uh, to generate a given unit of you know say bioethanol or something very often actually at, at present especially in the US you actually have to put more fossil fuel into the system than you actually get bioethanol out, which sounds a lot like a subsidy to me. Uh, yeah, or it's just stupid. Take your pick. Um, but yeah, that's very, that, that, that's very, very true. And one of the things that, that we don't spend enough time on is actually talking about efficiency. Um, you know, we don't design robust systems to be more, in, more efficient. Um, you know, you, you see some half-hearted things like replacing incandescent light bulbs with uh, uh, low-energy ones. Um, but you know, a lot of it is just a lot of it is tokenism, is is real tokenism, and in fact, actually, our societal unwillingness to confront the idea that we might actually live in a have to live in a lower energy environment, and what some of those changes will entail, um, actually impedes us actually having a, a sensible debate about what the right way forward is. Um, you know, the human mind. Um, really wants to latch on to this idea of a fix or that it's, there's something that, that we can do that doesn't, that's pain-free and hardship-free that, that will get you across to some promised land. And humans always have, you know, I mean, we're natural optimists, you know, um, but, you know, the, the, the brutal fact of the matter is, is that the world might not, have, might not be so accommodating, you know, and it's actually a psychological change that you need to make inside of yourself uh, rather than trying, to, hoping and praying that the world will actually accommodate your worldview, um, I don't know if that's that's probably that didn't answer your question at all, did it? Did it? Oh, 
okay, to some extent. Anything else? Anyone else? Uh, oh, yeah, oh, Mr. Keen over there. Uh, oh, well, hang on a minute. I've been told that, that we have to kill it there because Rob's waving and stuff. Um, but you can, if you want to come and talk to me later, you know, then that's, that's cool too. I'll be in the smoking lounge uh, getting stoned now because uh, I can. So, thank you very much. <laughs>